1867, Scrooge McDuck was born to a poor family in Glasgow, Scotland. He grew up a relatively normal duckling until his 10th birthday. Scrooge's father took him to see the remains of the old McDuck clan castle. See, their family wasn't always super poor, and Scrooge was inspired by the sight of their former glory. So the next day, he got a job and earned his first money ever. A dime. Problem was, it was an American dime, and Scrooge was in Scotland. Naturally feeling pretty cheated, Scrooge swore he'd build his fortune by being, I quote, tougher than the toughies and sharper than the sharpies. So he hopped over to America to start his quest for wealth. And judging by his money vault today, where he literally swims in gold, I'd say he did a pretty effing good job. No obstacle was too difficult to keep him from fortune. By my estimations, his entire net worth today rests around 300 quadrillion dollars. Rich as he is, he's got to defend his treasure trove somehow. So this wealthy waterfowl's got more guns than I do. Not to mention the trusty cannons he has hidden around his manor. <laughs> Nothing like some old-fashioned artillery for home defense. Scrooge also has a number of unorthodox high-tech firearms. Or as normal people call them, laser guns. My favorite is the one that can shoot through solid steel titanium. It's called the Burglar Stunner, but I'm pretty sure that'll do a hell of a lot more than stun you. Well, my favorite would be Scrooge's Neutra Friction and Anti-Inertia Rays. By removing a target's natural friction and inertia, these guns can turn a foe so slippery they can't grip anything, or take away all momentum from that foe's movement and weight. Without friction, a person will slide miles upon miles with no hope of stopping themselves. Without inertia, a cannonball will have even less impact than falling leaves, though it is important to note that these guns do not affect personal gravity. Uh, yeah, science and stuff. Though if I were him, I'd prefer the feel of one of his rifles or swords. Or his signature sidearm, his trusty cane. What's so special about a dusty old cane, you ask? Well, just look at the old quack go! Not every duck can turn their cane into both a club and a pogo stick. Even when he's unarmed, Scrooge's thirst for wealth has pushed his body past many preconceived limits. He possesses incredible strength, speed, and durability. Not to mention, the dude's got some serious huevos. One time when he was stuck in the savanna, he walked right up to a lion, beat it in a roaring match, and then just rode it all the way to town. He's also a surprisingly skilled marksman. Like some sort of gun-toting Mr. Miyagi, he can shoot flies out of the air with perfect precision. And he's no slouch with a blade. Apparently, Buffalo Bill taught him how to knife fight in, uh, engine style. <laughs> and, and now's a great time to remind you that Scrooge is pretty old. It was a different time. Ah, uh, racism aside, it takes a lot to put this mighty mallard down. He survived the Titanic sinking, being frozen solid in the Yukon, fighting hordes of wild animals, and taking a cannon shot to the face before being dragged through a minefield. He's even survived a trip to the literal center of the Earth, which, if you've forgotten, is pretty much super lava. That's putting it mildly. The Earth's core is estimated to be well over 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. More than hot enough to cook your goose. He's outrun a cheetah, which can reach 75 miles per hour. He's stopped a charging water buffalo, which can weigh up to 2,600 pounds. And you ever hear that legend where George Washington threw a silver dollar across the Potomac River? Well, Scrooge can do that too. And he even caught the coin on the other side. Because Scrooge isn't going to waste a single dollar. Seems pretty impressive, but Scrooge has some massively problematic flaws. Least of all is his age. He's 150 years old. That won't do him any favors in a fight. And why can't he fly? I mean, he's a duck with his own private plane. And he has human teeth. And they really should just hire a poultry scientist at Disney. Oh, I'll send my resume. Well, more importantly would be his overpowering greed. He can often lose sight of his goals or explode into an uncontrollable rage if someone threatens his wealth. He is pretty selfish and has a one-track mind. I don't know if the uncontrollable rage part, though, is such a bad thing. Certainly not in some situations. Like the time Soapy Slick tried to rip Scrooge off, steal his property, and humiliate him by chaining him to a steamboat and making fun of his letters from home, including one informing Scrooge of his mother's passing. That's more than enough to piss Scrooge off. So much that he literally tore the entire boat apart with his bare hands. Or wings. Holy damn, that's a real foul strength. 
just goes to show that nothing can stand between Scrooge and his wealth. I don't know which was wilder in those days, the wolves or me. <laughs> From days of long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. In less cryptic terms, 1200 years ago, the evil Drool Empire nearly conquered the entire known universe. But not everybody was cool with fleets of ships shooting up their planets, so a team of scientists and magic priests decided to fight back. Through the marriage of magic and technology, they forged a 300-foot-tall living automaton so powerful that it single-handedly pushed back the Empire's onslaught. Before long, the whole universe had heard of the mechanical knight known as Voltron. Pissed that he was losing everything because of some space robot, the Empire's King Zarkon ordered a space witch to kill Voltron with a magic space spell. And it kinda worked? Instead of being destroyed, Voltron was split up into five very merchandisable robot lions. Divided and stripped of its sentience, the universe's best hope had fallen. Until five space explorers crash landed on Eris, the exact same planet the lions just so happened to be hiding on. Destiny or some crap led them to the castle where the Princess Allura gave them a life-changing opportunity. Pilot the long-lost lions and go around saving the universe for a living. Keith Cogain is the head of the Lion Force in more ways than one. As leader of the team, he commands his cohorts, and he pilots the Black Lion, the literal head of Voltron. Lance McClain is the Han Solo of the group. This hot-headed show-off controls the Red Lion, which forms Voltron's right arm. Soyoshi Garrett, better known as Hunk, is the muscle of the team. He pilots the Yellow Lion, which forms Voltron's left leg. The Blue Lion is piloted by Sven Holgersen. <laughs> No, oh, he did. <laughs> the Blue Lion is piloted by Princess Allura herself, taking over after the original pilot got a bad case of stabbing. Her lion forms Voltron's right leg. Last up is Daryl Stoker. You can call him Pidge. Pidge pilots the Green Lion, Voltron's left arm. And he's also, well, a little unhinged. Pidge, get rid of that grenade! At least his outfit matches his lion's colors. I mean, damn, it's not that hard, people. And when all five lions combine, Voltron lives again. Activate Mega Thrusters. Voltron! Form feet and legs. Form arms and body. And I'll form the head. Think about how the pilots stay in the heads of the lions when they're fighting? That has to be, like, ridiculously nauseating. Oh, undoubtedly. That's probably why they usually travel by flight and prefer long-range combat over hand-to-hand. -hand. Speaking of which, Voltron got busy fighting Zarkon's giant row beasts and saving the universe with a huge assortment of weapons. Voltron can shoot Stingray missiles and even pillars of flame out of its hands and feet, or blast the lion heads off like rockets. It can stun enemies with ion dart lasers from its head, or use the Electro Force cross attack from its chest. On Keith's command, the Lion Force can manifest Voltron's most powerful weapons out of thin air, everything from spinning laser blades to javelins to nunchucks. But the real showstopper is the almighty Blazing Sword. Form Blazing Sword! With this blade, Voltron can slice through most Robies like Jello and dish out the Starfire attack, which splits Robies apart and also makes a friggin' tornado for good measure. The Blazing Sword can also conduct electricity to recharge Voltron itself. Why are all these swords also batteries? The Blazing Sword is enormously powerful, capable of destroying a satellite hundreds of times larger than Voltron. Voltron himself is powerful enough to melt meteors, kick giant machines sky high, and tank explosions the size of countries. The Voltron Lions have even traveled between galaxies in less than a day, making them several times faster than the speed of light. Voltron has also survived landing on the Omega Comet, which is so dense it possesses the gravitational force of a black hole. Okay, that all sounds insane, but even giant robot man lions have their limits. Like getting ganged up on by multiple row beasts at once, or getting stabbed and sliced open. But black hole levels of gravity? <laughs> That's a gangwalk, right? 
Voltron may be strong, but it lacks the finesse and skill of one trained in martial arts. Voltron also carries a shocking design flaw. If the release plates on its joints are struck in combat, it could jettison an entire limb from the core body. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me that if I kick Voltron, freaking Voltron, in the shins hard enough, he'll just lose a leg and it'll just pop right off? Essentially, yes, though it has only happened in training. Even so, whether the Lion Force is up against a technical issue or a colossal robeast, the universe can always depend on Voltron. Thank <laughs> you.